Hello, good afternoon, Cleveland Opera Theater listeners. So it is once again time for Opera 101. My name is Megan Thompson, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for the company. And uh, today we wade into yet another um, difficult topic. We're going to be talking about Orientalism in opera and in the repertoire. Now, as always, if you have questions, comments, concerns, requests, the comment section on this video is a great place to leave that, but you're also welcome to send us a private message or send me an email directly, uh, and we will definitely try to address your comments and questions either in today's session or in a future Opera 101 session. So, uh, I tend to like to pick these really difficult topics that make people uncomfortable. So, well, you know, Opera 101 might not be quite the right moniker, maybe it should be more like 201, 401, you know, something like that. But it's very important that we recognize in 2020 some of the historical context as well as some of the issues that opera encounters. So today, um, yesterday, if you missed it, go back and watch it. Yesterday was more about um, the black experience in opera, uh, the representation or lack thereof in the operatic repertoire, and what are some of the things that we can do about it in 2020 to um, bring more equality in. So today we're going to focus more on the Asian experience, Orientalism, and opera. Um, I do not profess to be an expert, but I have done a pretty significant amount of research in this realm for my own knowledge, but there's a lot of really interesting material out there on the uh, internet, so if this is something of interest to you, I encourage you to go and do your own research as we will only scratch the surface today. There's a much deeper topic than I can possibly cover in a quick video. Um, but we will scratch the surface. We will at least bring up a few of those things that you should uh, be aware of as you're enjoying opera and operatic repertoire, and uh, we'll go from there. So first off, I think it helps if we define what is Orientalism. Um, it's really, ultimately the thing is, it's the way the West perceives the East, and therefore it's the way we portray the East. So it refers to the artifacts, uh, traits that are characteristic of people and cultures of Asia. Um, it's the representation of Asia, the Middle East, anywhere, basically all of the, that foreign Eastern land. Um, it's that representation in a very stere stereotypical way uh, that's regarded as really embodying that colonialist attitude. Um, so one of the things that you have to kind of keep in mind here is we're talking about an art form that originated well before Google, well before YouTube. So first off, we have to have some historical context here. There was a fascination in Europe with the Far East. Ever since the Silk Road opened up in about 130 BC, uh, there was fascination. You'd hear these stories from travelers who were coming back on the Silk Road. They'd bring these tales of the people they met and the things they saw and the clothes they wore. And so it really painted this really exotic picture. Um, you didn't just jump on a plane and go visit China yourself. It was all hearsay from the folks who were coming back. So this route was historically, you know, absolutely irreplaceable in history. Um, this is how we really open trade with China. This is where a lot of different um, things were getting moved back and forth between China and Europe. This is where we finally start seeing some of that um, like cross-pollination of ideas. Uh, so it was established back in the Han Dynasty in China back in 130 BC, and it was open and used all the way until the mid-1400s, um, all the way until the Ottoman Empire decided to boycott trade and that's when the, the Silk Road closed officially. Um, but the, the tales lived on, that fascination lived on. So it's really important to, to keep that in mind. So we have this fascination with the Far East. You know, you ha have the map right behind me. I hope you can see it. I'm not even going to attempt to point because the whole mirroring effect, I was pointed to the wrong place. But you can see Europe uh, and China and the Far East are, are truly far. When you don't have any digital means to explore these lands, you're relying on your imagination. Now, why is that a problem? Well, the problem is stories first off get distorted anyway as they travel through time. Um, you have then descriptions that are potentially 
offensive <laughs> coming back. You know, you can imagine traders who are coming and describing skin. Uh, one, one historical book that I read, uh, skin is yellow as though it was jaundiced. You know, that's not exactly a flattering description of, of somebody uh, living in Asia. And so they saw it simply as representing, um, you know, accuracy, but, but that's not really, you know, such a, such a great way, especially now in 2020, we would find that very inappropriate. Um, the other historical context, though, that I want to bring up is not only is it just fascination with the Far East in general, but specifically in the 1800s, we ended up in this point of Japanisme, where it's a French term referring back to the popularity and influence of Japan. Japanese art, design, music, they, it was just a fascination, especially in Central Europe, Western Europe. And it really... It was really following the, the reopening of trade with Japan because that's when, again, you start getting these influences into the culture. But if you look through the art of the period, the music of the period, you'll see a lot of examples of imaginings of what Japanese kimonos looked like. Uh, you'll hear like the five, the pentatonic scale in a lot of music. Um, there's instrumental music as well as vocal music where they, we start seeing these influences incorporated. So it was definitely fascination. You know, it's something foreign, it's something new, it's something exciting. And so for the most part, our artists and composers were not trying to be disrespectful. So you always have to hold that in mind as we're talking about these things. That said, as we look through opera, um, there's a lot of examples of operas that are set in the Far East, Middle East, Sri Lanka, you know, they're, they're all over. Um, our composers are doing their best, or at least in theory were. The problem is, these are some of the only representations we have in the operatic repertoire of Asians, and they're not all necessarily great representations. So there's a real conflict, especially um, there's been a lot of highlight here in the States. Seattle Opera has done a lot uh, on this issue for their productions of the Mikado and Madame Butterfly. There's been a lot of conflict in Asian Americans because they really want to see themselves on stage, as do we all. But a lot of times the portrayals that these operas bring to stage are inaccurate and offensive. Um, so it gets to be gets to be like this this interior inter, internal like war with yourself because it's like well I want to see myself on stage I want to see an Asian character but that's not how I want to be perceived none of us want to see a negative stereotype of ourselves being portrayed um turned out's a great example of this it's very racist in a lot of ways in how it portrays the Asian characters uh, for example ping pang and pong can you think of anything more stereotypical or negative in terms of stereotype? Um, Puccini never visited China. No YouTube, no Google, like he was doing his best. He actually took an Iranian tale and set it in China. Um, so he was just really, I think we all have to look at it. It was a fairy tale. He's trying to evoke this very foreign, fantastic, evocative, um, you know, ethnic feel just to really set it aside from Europe. So there are ways of fixing this. This is actually an easier one to fix because it's already a fairy tale. There's no pretending that it's real. You can do fun things, enhance those fairy tale qualities, displace the opera from reality so that the stereotypes no longer are stereotypes of any real culture, but they can become just a fictional narrative. Um, for instance, there was one production, I believe it was a Canadian production, that instead of Ping Pang and Pong, named the character something like Jim, Bob, and Tim, or something like that, basically just indicating these are just, you know, three generic characters in the opera. It doesn't have to be that they're Asian, doesn't have to be anything offensive. Um, Bavarian State Opera did a really interesting production that was all future dystopian, and it had projections, and ice skaters, and dancers, and aerialists, and so it was really different and obviously not traditional China. Um, so these are some, some of the ways that we can kind of counteract some of those, those things. Then we look at an opera though that's like Madame Butterfly. Um, again, Puccini, he, was, he himself was definitely of this Japanese way where he's really fascinated with the Eastern culture. Um, Madame Butterfly is a little stickier because now we're trying to portray, portray an opera about, um, you know, quote unquote real people. But the problem is that we have a white man interpreting another white man's book 
based on another white man's journal. So we never have, you know, any kind of authentic experience represented in any of the source material. Um, and then, you know, when you have a white man interpreting who's never even been to Japan, who's using his own imagination, it gets further convoluted. Now, again, in his defense, he did do his best to get things right. He even talked to, um, oh gosh, I believe it was the ambassador to Japan, uh, the attache, and he walk, worked with his wife, listened to music box clips to try to incorporate traditional Japanese melodies into Madame Butterfly. So he was, he was trying, um, and we always have to kind of accept that. But the problem is now there are a lot of productions that do not get things right, don't even necessarily use traditional Japanese dress. They use something generically Asian in their production, which is very disrespectful. Um, the other problem with Madame Butterfly is some of it's just connotation here in the States. There are a lot of references to her being a geisha um, that I could go on for an hour about that particular thread, but look up exactly what a geisha was in Japanese history because it is not what most of us have as our connotation. Um, it was actually a very skilled person. Um, so there were some, some misrepresentations in, in the way that Puccini, Puccini and his librettists put this together. But moving on, because again, I'm supposed to be going quickly and I'm already talking too much. One of the most problematic operas, operettas that comes up in this conversation is the Mikado. The Mikado very much uh, is very, even at the time, was, it was pretty offensive. So the issue is there are a lot of negative stereotypes, a lot of stereotypical attitudes, what the British thought, you know, Japanese people were like, used, you know, quote unquote, cute Japanese names like Nanki Poo, Pooba. Um, these were yum yum. Like these are definitely not traditional real names. They were made up, you know, based on what they thought Japanese people would be named. I, I definitely see all of the social problems with this opera. I am not defending the social issues. Please be very clear about that. I do have to say that, again, in Gilbert and Sullivan's defense, their point was they were trying to satirize British bureaucracy. Um, it was never meant to represent Japanese culture. It was supposed to, it was always supposed to be British people dressed up as Japanese people making fun of British people. So, so that we get back into this issue. Well, how can we do it in a way that 2020 finds acceptable? Well, you could do it with a Japanese cast. You could change names or something. You could not even try to wear traditional clothing. You know, wear a pair of chucks with a kimono. Make it very clear that it's just a satire and it's not supposed to be anything, you know, specific. Again, kind of looking at it more from that turn down perspective. It doesn't have to be realistic. If it was never meant to be realistic. Um, so these are some of the things. Uh, Pearl Fisher's had another issue. That was the one set in Sri Lanka. Lakme. We have a we have several. We have these same same types of issues going through the repertoire. And the the other problem is, if you think about it, how many other operas have been written even recently that represent Asian culture? You're probably not thinking of a whole lot. Maybe Nixon in China came to mind about Mao. So again still kind of an iffy topic in terms of representation. Um, so that's one of the problems. We need more operas about the subject written by people of Asian descent that will actually make it into the repertoire and then companies need to commit to performing them because anything can be written, but if it's not getting performed, nobody knows it's out there, nobody comes to appreciate it, and it certainly doesn't make its place in the canon. Um, one of the biggest problems too in this whole list of things that we've already talked about is yellow face. So there's yellow, you've heard of black face. Um, yellow face is the same principle, you're using makeup to try to mimic being Asian in a very negative way. Again, if you feel strongly enough that your character absolutely must be Asian, then find an Asian singer. Do not use makeup to try to make up that difference. It's not going to work and it's going to be very offensive. Um, we'll just leave it at that, period. One of the questions that comes up is why do we still perform these problematic works? Why are we still putting on Turin Dot and Butterfly and Mikado? Well, they're classics. They're classics in the canon. They sell tickets. They have beautiful music. You know, it's, it's really something to sing Butterfly. You know, do we really want to lose Un Bel D from the repertoire? Probably not. So 
this gets into that gray area. Will we ever stop performing them? Probably eventually. There'll be some time when social justice gets to the point where we just won't do them, period, because they're seen as dated. Until that point, what can we do? Have a consultant on your site, uh, on site, on staff, who can ensure accurate representation. Ensure the historical accuracy of costumes if you're going for a realistic effect, and if you're not going for realism, then make it very obvious to your audience that it is a fairy tale, it is fantastic, it's not to be uh, conceived as a representation of real life. Um, so some of the things I mentioned yesterday that still hold true for, for today's topic, make sure your translations are modernized, make sure your super titles are all in modern language, that any racist language has been removed. That's a huge step. Educate your audiences. You know, just like I've been telling you today that we have to bear in mind some of the historical context that folks didn't have Google and YouTube, go ahead and take a few minutes to do a pre-show talk, offer a lecture beforehand, do some program notes, have a video blog like we're doing right now. Maybe it's even a podcast. Do something to make sure that your audiences are coming in, understanding the historical connection, understanding where this came from, what it was actually originally meant to be, and what your production is trying to do with the material. Cast accordingly. If you have Asian singers available, they should be cast in the Asian roles. If you don't have Asian singers available, perhaps you need to rethink your, uh, your production. Um, if you're in a portion of the country where that is very difficult, then, you know, maybe there is some, some cross-casting, cross, uh, but just try to be respectful have people of the appropriate race singing those, those roles without pigeonholing them only in those roles. And then of course, get creative. You know, again, Turandot, going back to that one, such a great example, it does not have to be traditional. Mikado does not have to be traditional. The satire will still come through if you totally displace it and remove some of that, that racist um, body language and staging. So this is a huge issue in the opera world. Um, so I do want to mention that if you are interested in learning more about this topic, I highly encourage you to look up the Opera America Conference, which is underway right now virtually. Today, this afternoon, there is a session at 2 o'clock about creating real belonging. And it gets into the details of colorblind casting has really been uh, the go-to for years, but what else can we do to get away from stereotypes, to stop this negative reinforcement, and to really create a true sense of belonging in the repertoire. So it's today at 2 o'clock. You can look it up on Opera America's website. Um, there will be a replay tomorrow at 1.15. And then the other thing is tomorrow at 2 o'clock, there's a panel discussion in Q&A. So I know I personally am planning to join today. I encourage you to as well. And I definitely encourage you to do more uh, research on these topics if they are of interest. It's really fascinating to start digging into all of this material, both the historical and the current. So again, thank you so much for joining me on Opera 101. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you again today. My name is Megan Thompson. If you have questions, comments, concerns, requests, please use our comment box or send me a message uh, via Facebook, private email, or any other way you can think of to get me information. It's been a pleasure. Definitely join us again tomorrow for Page to Stage. Have a great afternoon.